Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. I'm Joel's dad. I used to have my own name, but now I'm Joel's dad. And uh, actually, I'm okay with that. That's all right. That's okay. I'm glad you guys. Uh, I, I want you know. Speaking of that, I just want to thank you guys for the way you've accepted him and. You know, there's nothing better to a dad than see their kids accepted and loved by others. And, and you guys are making him a better person. And thank you for accepting his family and Emily and Elise. And just thank you for loving on them and just accepting them. You are, you are a, 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 an influence in their life. That's a very positive thing. And we just want to thank you for that. And uh, my wife uh, couldn't be here today because we just got the call this week. Uh, Pastor uh, Marcus uh, is not feeling well. Or at least that's what he says. It's a Super Bowl Sunday, so you guys, I don't know, you know, you, you figure that one out. You know, you might want to take a note next Super Bowl Sunday, see if he's here, if he kind of miraculously begins to feel bad on that too. So anyway, so he called me this week, and my wife was already committed to sing in another church this week, and so she's ministering there, and she was so disappointed she wanted to come with me this morning. So it's just me, just me this morning. You get the, you get the least half of the, of the couple here, so... Well, delighted to be with you, and uh, just want to say uh, thank you guys for uh, the opportunity to share with you this morning. I'm going to continue to look at that series on running to the battle, and uh, let me just ask you a question. Start off with a question this morning. Have you, um, have you ever met somebody that they just kind of walk at another level with the Lord? You know, they just seem to, whenever problems come their way or difficulties or struggles, or they just seem to have a confidence and a joy and a peace even through difficult times. You know somebody like that? Don't you just hate them? You know, <laughs> no, no, not really. But you know, you, sometimes you wonder how did they? Were they just born that way, or how did they get to be that way? You know, what 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 caused them to be walking at this other level with the Lord? That's actually what we're going to talk about today, because I've I've seen and 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 experienced and been walking with the Lord myself fifty years. I realized this year it's fifty years I've been walking with the Lord. That's longer than most of you've been around, right? You know, and so. Um, <laughs> I've, I've seen a thing or two and learned a thing or two, you know, and uh, one of the things I've seen is that people who, who tend to walk on that other level with the Lord didn't just get there accidentally. They all experienced something. They had an experience, and actually, when you talk to them, it's an experience that they had multiple times, and you say, well, that kind of leaves me out. No, 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 because this is an experience that you have had as well and will have again in the future. And so you say, okay, so it's not the experience that causes people to walk at another level, but it's their response to that experience. And that's what I want to talk about today. That experience that we all have and will have multiple times and how we respond to that. Because how we respond to that is what will determine if we go down and we get bitter or if we go up and we get better. Because one of those things is going to happen when that experience comes into our life. So we're going to look at that this morning. And again, we're in this uh, series, uh, Run to the Battle. It's uh, about the life of David. And that, of course, is based upon the story where David confronts Goliath. And you, you, when you read it, he didn't just mosey or meander out to meet Goliath. He ran to the battle to meet Goliath. And so that's where this title comes from, and it's from the life of David. And so we're going to look at the life of David, and you're going to find that David experienced the thing that I'm going to talk about this morning, and he responded to that, but he responded in a proper way. So he's our example, or one example, of how to respond when that experience comes into your life. And so we'll look at David and learn from him. And uh, so just by way of refresher, you know, you're probably somewhat familiar with the life of David, but let's just, I'll just kind of quickly go over his life, bring us up to speed, and look at the experience that he had that, cho that he made a response to, he made a choice in, and it's the choice that caused him to get better, because David was really an amazing man. In the Old Testament, there weren't many people like him. He had an understanding of the heart of God that far exceeded most people around him. He somehow understood that God preferred obedience to sacrifice. You know, this was a sacrificial thing, and you do this, and you pay this price, and you, you, you do all these things, and that pleases God. And David understood that it was obedience that was more important than sacrifice. David went in one time, and he, he took the, the, the bread, the holy bread that was reserved only for the priest, but he understood, he understood the heart of God. 
not just the laws and the rules and the regulations. And so he had had this experience with God that took him to a new level. And I want to live there. You want to live there too, right? We all want to be there. We want to be at this just growing in our faith and walking in a new level of God. So here's, how, here's that experience, and then we're going to see how he responded to it and see how it applies to our life. David, as you remember, we're, we're introduced to him. He's just a guy out in the field watching his dad's sheep. Nobody special. Uh, and his brothers come, and they say, hey, the, the, the prophet, the priest, Samuel, is in our house, and he wants, wants to see you. So David goes home, and next thing he knows, this crazy prophet, this crazy priest is pouring a, a, a horn, ram's horn of oil on his head, anointing him to be the next king of Israel. What's that all about? Well, he didn't go to the palace yet. He just went back out in the field, back out to watch the sheep. The only difference was now he had oil all over him, you know. Well, there was another difference, too, because the Scripture says that from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Daniel. Or Daniel. Came upon, what was his name? David. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, and the Spirit of the Lord left Saul. Now, who was Saul? Saul was the king. Saul was a, a humble man when we first met him, um, but he became king. God told him ahead of time, prophesied, I'm going to appoint you king. And they, they, uh, when he was uh, chosen as king, he actually went and hid. He didn't want the position. But once he got the position, he decided he kind of liked it. He kind of liked the position. He kind of liked the power. He kind of liked the influence. And so then he began to do what he could to hold on to it. And so he began to please the people more than he pleased the Lord. And so after a couple of times, Samuel had to come back to him and says, Saul, the Lord's told you. He gave you this position, but you're not obeying him, you're not listening to him, so he's going to take it back from you, and he's going to anoint somebody else to be king. So Saul knew somebody else was going to be king, but he didn't know who. And now Samuel comes and anoints David to be the king. Well, and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David, leaves Saul. The next chapter is what you talked about here last week, where David ran out to meet Goliath, and he whacked him with the rock. And uh, the rock, uh, you know, we talk about David killed the giant with his little sling. Actually, uh, if you read it carefully, the, the sling, the stone kind of knocked him down, and then David ran up and grabbed his sword and cut Goliath's head off. I think that's the product that probably killed him. That probably, that would do it, I would think, right? You know, we don't like to talk about those stories with the kids, you know, that's gory stuff. You know, that, that shouldn't be in the Bible, you know. But David kills Goliath, and then um, David, what he had done now is he had brought great honor to the king. He had helped Saul out. And so Saul, the battle is won. David, the troops all respond to David's courage, and they go out and they win the battle. And, and on the way home, Saul hears the ladies singing the song, the victory song. All the women are singing, Saul has killed his thousands. And he's singing, I like this song, until he hears the second verse. And the second verse is, and David, his ten thousands. Wait a minute, who's this David dude? What's, you know, I'm the king. I'm the guy who's supposed to be in charge here. I'm the guy everybody's supposed to be lauding and, and, and worshiping and, and proud of. Well, as it said in the Scripture there, then Saul, from that day forward, when David was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And here's one that messed with your theology. It messes with mine. An evil spirit came upon Saul. But it says an evil spirit from the Lord. So this evil spirit comes upon Saul and it torments him. I think Saul kind of opened his heart to it by his unforgiveness, his bitterness, his, his lust for power and, and, and not honoring God above everything else. But he's tormented. And some of his people in his, in his uh, entourage there say, you know, we, we know there's this young boy out here who, who plays well and he sings and he worships and maybe he can bring you some relief. So they go and they get David and David is brought into the palace. And sure enough, when David plays and when David sings, when David worships, this evil spirit departs from Saul. You know, the devil just hates worship, doesn't he? He just get let me out of here if worship is going on. And so, so David would worship the Lord and Saul would find some relief from this torment from the evil spirit. And so again, here we find David blessing Saul, helping him, encouraging him, being a, being a support and a help to Saul. And so David's done Saul nothing but good. But somewhere along the line, Saul figures out, this is the guy that's been anointed to be the king. He's the one. He's my competition. He's the one who's going to take my place. And he begins to see David as his enemy. And, uh, and David's done nothing but good to him. 
But one day, Saul, and, and, and sitting on the throne, and as David's playing, that spirit just kind of possesses him, and he reaches over and he grabs his spear, and he hurls it at David. And David, being a young, agile guy, is able to jump away, and it misses him. And what do you normally do when somebody throws a spear at you? Well, you reach, you grab that spear, and you throw it back at him, right? Just, uh, you throw a spear at me, I'm going to throw two back at you twice as hard, right? I mean, that's a natural way to respond, right? But we're not supposed to be natural beings, are we? We're supposed to be supernatural, living above and beyond the natural realm. And so David, he doesn't grab the spear. Instead, he just flees. And then he comes back and he ministers to Saul and he keeps trying to bless and help Saul. And this happens again. And finally, David realizes that his life is in danger if he sticks around with Saul. And so he disappears and we find him. He goes and he finds this cave that he can hide out in. And he begins living in a cave. Think about that. And he, it, worse than that, his family realizes that the king is out to kill our son. Well, we may be in danger as well because if he's trying to find our son, the most natural thing would be for him to come and take us. And so his whole family has to leave their home, leave everything behind, and they move down and they live in a cave. Think about, think about the misery that Saul has brought upon a man and a family who've done him nothing but good. They helped him in the battle. David sang and gave him relief from this demonic spirit, this evil spirit that came upon him. And now they're living in a cave. One night you're sleeping in your home, in a nice comfy bed, and the next night you're in a, sleeping on a dirt floor in a cave. And so here David has done nothing but good to Saul, and yet Saul has repaid him with evil. He did nothing to deserve it, and Saul's hurt him, hurt his family. He's, he's driven them away. And they're having to live uh, in a cave. And I think um, those who, that experience that we're talking about here is an experience that those who live on a higher plane, I've discovered, have all gone through. They've gone through a situation where they've done nothing wrong, but evil has come their way. People have stabbed them in the back. People have slander them. People have treated them unkindly. And you go, man, how could, how could anybody treat somebody as nice as you unkindly, right? And yet, you do that. You've, you've been treated unkindly. And when, when that happens, we have a choice to make. Now, that, those things, I guarantee you, will happen to all of us. There's going to be times when we live in a world of injustice. We live in a world where, where things just aren't always fair. In fact, they're never fair, right? Things just, it's just not fair. And so these things all happen to us. We all have that experience. Here's what I've discovered, though, is people who live on a higher plane with the Lord, they've had that experience. They've had that experience many times. But when that experience came, they chose to respond in a different way than the normal way, a, a way that's really counterintuitive. In other words, by counterintuitive, it, it simply means that's not the way you would normally think to do that. That's not the way you'd normally think to respond in that situation. How did they respond? Well, they responded the same way David did. I'm convinced that the reason David was able to not retaliate against Saul, not take revenge. In fact, he had two opportunities dropped in his lap where he could have killed Saul. Just one time Saul was sleeping before him. He could have just stuck a spear in him, slid his, could have just killed him. And David had no problem killing people. I mean, he was a man of blood. He was a warrior. He, he wiped out whole cities. I mean, he, he had no problem killing people. But when he had that opportunity laid before him, there was the man that was bringing so much misery into his life and his, his family's life. And there he was. All he had to do was just put an end to it right there. And he said this. He said, I will not touch God's anointed. Now, wait a minute, David. Um, he used to be God's anointed. But he's, he's demon-possessed now. He can't still be God's anointed. But see, that anointing that was put upon Saul, the anointing that was upon David, that's, that's like an Old Testament picture of what we would call our salvation. When the oil, that symbol of the Holy Spirit, was poured upon them, when we become a believer, when we give our life to Jesus, that oil of the Holy Spirit is not only poured upon us, but He comes to dwell within us. 
And so what David is saying is, this man is not my enemy, he's my brother. Wait a minute. This is the guy that stabbed you in the back, David. This is the guy that threw the spear at you. He's not your, he is my brother. He's being used by the enemy, but he is my brother. I'm convinced that's the reason that David was able to keep a pure heart towards Saul. Because here's a problem I found that we have many times as believers in the battles that we fight. We must never confuse who we're fighting against with who we are fighting for. We're fighting against, the Bible tells us, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual forces, principalities, powers, spiritual forces. We're fighting for flesh and blood. You see, we're in a war, a war of liberation. It's like World War II. World War II was a war of liberation where the U.S. fought to liberate Europe. The U.S. fought to liberate the Philippines and the Pacific Islands. It was a war of liberation. There were people out there who needed to be set free from the oppression. And so we went to war. David fought to liberate Israel from control of the Philistines. And we're in a battle too. And we're liberating those that are flesh and blood from the slave masters that are the spiritual forces. But the problem is, sometimes we see that flesh and blood, they're the ones that are used to attack. They're the ones that are used to throw the spears at us. And so it's easy to say, that's my enemy, that mean and nasty boss, that mean and nasty ex-husband or ex-wife, that mean or nasty neighbor. They're the enemy. That one that's treating me unfairly, that one that's slandering me, that one that's saying those things aren't true, that one that's trying to destroy my business, the one that's trying to destroy my life or my family that's making my life so miserable. They're the enemy. Not if they're flesh and blood. They're the ones that we're battling for. They're the ones we're battling to, to see liberated from bondage, from slavery to the enemy, which is the spiritual forces. But it's so easy to get that confused, isn't it? Because they're the ones that threw the spear at you. But here's the problem. If I then take that spear up and throw it back, guess what? I move from the enemy, from the liberator's camp into the enemy's camp. Because, you see, the enemy, his goal is to kill, to steal, to destroy. And if I'm taking that spear and I'm using it to tear up a family, if I'm using it to hurt an individual, if I'm tearing up a person, if I'm destroying their reputation, if I'm getting my revenge on somebody and their flesh and blood, I have moved from the camp of the liberator into the camp of the slaves. I become one of the enemy's tools. Because he's the one. His currency is revenge, retaliation. His currency is the bitter one, anger, resentment. That's the currency that the enemy deals in. And if I begin dealing in that, if I begin taking revenge myself, if I begin retaliating myself, if I begin getting even, well, that's exactly what happens. I get even. I get brought down to that level. I don't want to go down. I want to go up in my level with the Lord. You see, we see this in Jesus. In 1 Peter, it says, when they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Man, on the cross, he could have really threatened, couldn't he? You know, you, you can just imagine him up there, and they're all laughing at him and thinking, and, and, and I think if it had been me, I said, your day's coming. I'm going to see you. I'm going to see you. And wait till the, you see what I got planned for you. Aren't you glad it wasn't me up on that cross? <laughs> you know? But what did he say? He said the craziest thing. He said, Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. I came, Jesus came as the great liberator, and they didn't know what they were doing because they were serving, they were enslaved, they were blinded. They were enslaved to the enemy and they were being used by him. So David somehow was able to see Saul is not my enemy. He's being used by the enemy, but he's the one I'm fighting for. He's the one I want to see liberated. Now, that one that's attacking you, that one that's fighting you, you may say, I don't really want to see them liberated. I'd just soon see them go to hell, and the sooner the better, right? Yeah? Um, that may be your attitude, but that's not the Lord's attitude. And if that's not his attitude toward them, oh, doggone it, that shouldn't be my attitude either, should it? 
After all, he loves them. How can he love them? I don't know. How can he love you? How can he love me? <laughs> Same way, I guess, you know. How can he love them? How can he love me? How can he love each and every one of us? They're the target. They're the ones we're fighting for. They're not the ones we're fighting against. How does this work out in our own lives? Well, let me just tell you my own story, how it worked out in my life. Because I, I got a lot of them. I mean, <laughs> and here's what I found is when you face that uh, battle, if you win and you overcome, you'll find another one down the road later. If you don't, well, guess what? <laughs> you'll find another one down the road later. You'll get another opportunity. Here's how, here's how it shook out in my life. Um, I, uh, I, I had helped a guy who had, uh, had a couple moral failures in his life. I encouraged him, gave him an opportunity, um, stood up for him, defended him, and got him back on his feet. And all was going good, you know, and, and uh, he was uh, doing well and kind of got some authority and got some power. And I, I, I did have people who were kind of warning me. They said, this guy's, you know, he's going to stab you in the back. And, and I didn't listen to him. And that'll be my next sermon, listening to the wise counsel of people who are around you who care for you, you know. But, uh, but for today, I didn't listen to him. And, and sure enough, once he got a little authority and got a little power because of his own insecurity, just like Saul, because of his own insecurity, all of a sudden he began to see me as a threat. I was one of his biggest supporters. I was there encouraging him on, but he, but he began to see me as a threat. And so the next thing I know, I find a knife in my back. And um, it did the same thing. We, it, it hurt my family. It hurt um, my wife. We had to end up leaving the city. We ended up having to move. And so it was a thing that it would have been very easy to retaliate. It would have been very easy to retaliate. And I thought of all kinds of ways that I could really just screw this guy over and just do bad things to him. And it would have been really easy to do that. But, you know, I had learned what I'm going to share with you today and what I'm sharing with you today. Years ago, I'd been mentored by some good people who had showed me this in the life of David. And they showed me what David did when he was attacked, when he was mistreated, when he was slandered and libeled, and, when, and, and things were said against him. And so I said, okay, this is not going to be easy, but this is the way I'm going to respond. And I, I had to learn to look at that brother as a brother, not as an enemy. And I found I could do that because he was a brother. Well, he doesn't seem like he's acting like a brother, but he was a brother. He was flesh and blood, so therefore, he was not the enemy. Being used by the enemy, but he was not the enemy. And I could choose to, I could choose to retaliate, throw spears back, but to do that, I have to step into the enemy's camp and become one of his, being used by him as a tool to attack one of God's chosen does that make sense? Scale of 1 to 10, at least a 6. And I'm, here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I've seen. We think that in the Christian life, we're gonna, we start out here, and we just grow little by little by little by little and become more and more like Jesus. But here's what I found out. It doesn't work that way. We think that we start off here and, okay, wow, I'm a new believer. I'm just saved. And I got all these habits and things and thought lives and way of, but but I'm going to day by day become more and more like Jesus. But I found that really Christian growth doesn't really take place that way. Here's the way it happens. It's more like you're kind of going along on a plane and boom, you hit a wall. It's like a staircase. You're going along. Everything's going good. You're, You're really not growing, not going, and then Boom, something comes along. You lose your job. Somebody slanders you. Somebody treats you unjustly. Something bad comes into your life. One of those mountains that we talk about, one of those giants comes into your life. And at that point in time, we have a choice to make. We can get bitter, which will take us down, or we can get better. How we respond when that difficulty when that struggle, when that obstacle, when you're treated unfairly, when you're treated unjustly, when, when bad things happen to you, when you are at a point where you have an opportunity to get better or get bitter, to move up a step in your walk with the Lord or to move down a step and, and regress and go backwards. That is an opportunity. Here's what I've found. When that opportunity comes, When you hit that wall, the way to go up a step is you apply the cross. What do I mean, apply the cross? When that situation came and I found myself stabbed in the back, I had a choice. I could retaliate. I could get bitter. I could get angry. I could get even. 
Or I could apply the cross of forgiveness, the blood of Jesus Christ to that, and say, this man is not my enemy. He sure looks like it and acts like it, but he's being used by the enemy. And I forgive him, and I let that go, and I'll tell you what, I can promise you, as one who has multiple wounds from multiple walls over these 50 years, I can promise you, if you will respond correctly in that situation, if you will do like Jesus did, don't retaliate, don't slander back, don't attack back, but you commit it to the one who judges justly. Lord, this is your son. I'm your child. I commit this to you. I let you work it out. If you will do that, and I'm telling you, it is not easy, and you will never do it perfectly. There were a lot of times when I just mm, thought of, wow, the things. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, I would probably go to jail for that because uh, I would get caught because I'm not really good at being sneaky. Okay, so uh, otherwise, no, no, no. Um, so the point is, if you will respond correctly in that situation, it's not easy. And you don't have to do it perfectly. But I can guarantee you, if you will respond correctly, you'll find yourself walking at a new level of peace and joy and understanding of the heart of God. It's not easy. You will not do it perfectly. And it doesn't happen quickly either. I mean, this last one, I mean, I could tell you all kinds of walls we've hit, you know, but every one takes you higher. And that means the next one's probably going to be harder. But if you're you'll respond correct. This last one was the hardest one my family's ever gone through. But we were ready for it because we've been through all these little ones. We've been through all these smaller ones that build your strength. It's like lifting little weights and then you get bigger weights and bigger weights. And I could have never lifted that weight. That would have wiped me out 20 years ago. But God was conforming me to the image of Jesus. And what the heck is the image of Jesus? It's one who's been brutalized. It's one who's been hurt and abused by people he did nothing but good to. You want to be like your master? You're going to be abused. And that wall becomes an opportunity when you can step higher. And I remember just, it probably took us eight months to a year to really begin to feel the peace and the contentment that came from that one. But I can remember sitting on my porch sometimes and just, probably going to go to tears now, just sitting there thinking, God, you're so good to me. The goodness that where we are in our life right now is so, I'm so glad I'm not back there. That, that drove me out, but I'm so glad I'm here. The goodness and the joy and the peace that we have just in you and the, the blessings we're seeing in our lives and our kids and our grandkids. It's so good. So I'm just telling you, how do you get to that point? That wall is what you do when you hit that wall. You know, I say Pastor Marcus walks at a higher level than many of us, right? Ask him. I guarantee you, he's hit that wall. He's been slandered. He's been mistreated. He's been abused. And for, to people that he's done nothing but good to. I can tell you, Joel has. You know, I know him. He's my son. He has too. He walks at a higher level. And I know many of you do too. But if you're, if you're there and you're wondering, how do you get there? <laughs> if you hit the wall and you respond correctly. So let me just kind of summarize this real quickly. All you've seen is this. We're in a battle. It's a battle for liberation. It's a battle to liberate people from this slavery to themselves and to the evil one. It's a battle not against flesh and blood. If they're flesh and blood, they're not your enemy. <laughs> There's a spiritual enemy out there. And then don't be surprised. If you're walking along and you're doing good and you're blessing people, people start throwing spears at you. In fact... You can get kind of excited. I hit the wall. There's my chance. I get to go to another level. Woohoo! Does that sound crazy? That's what James said. He said, hey, count it all joy, brethren, when you face trials and temptations. Count it all joy. You got a chance to go to another level. He said, because you know that the testing of your faith develops patience. I'm not sure I want to be patient if that's what it takes to get there. You know? No, no, no. He says, that's not the end of it. And patience, when it has fulfilled its work in you, you will be complete, perfect, lacking nothing. Hey, I like the lacking nothing thing. But to get there, you got to go through the wall. And you got to respond correctly to that. 
trusting it to Jesus and he'll take you to that new level. You don't have to respond perfectly because you won't. But it's that heart battle. The battle we're talking about this week is that battle to keep your heart right when those offenses come, when you're treated unjustly. It's that battle to keep your heart right before the Lord, to remember who the true enemy is. And it's not flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. He's going he's gonna to use flesh and blood to attack you, but those are the people you're fighting for. They're not the ones you're fighting against. And if you choose to fight against them, then you move from the camp of the liberators to the camp of the enslaved. So I want to leave you with what, what Peter said that Jesus did. If we get sucked into that abyss of revenge, retaliation, fighting back, Here's the crazy thing about it. You know that other Christians, if you talk to most Christians, if you fight back and you retaliate and you get your revenge, you talk to most Christians, you tell them the story, they go, Phew, you were you were right in doing that, boy. You showed them. Good for you. You ain't gonna take nothing lying down. Good for you. That's the way most believers respond. That's why many believers are such miserable, cranky, grouchy, unhappy people because they respond in a natural way. And so you sow natural seed, you get natural fruit. You don't want that for your life. You, you want to be those that just walk at a higher level. This is how you do it, the same way Jesus did it. He said this in 1 Peter 2, when they hurled their insults at him, the natural thing would have been for him to insult back, right? He didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I want to say it one more time because this is so important when you go from here. Some of you are in that battle right now. Some of you are being treated, mistreated, unfairly judged. Some of you are going through some difficulties. You've hit that wall right now. This is a chance. This is an opportunity for you to go to a new level in the Lord. I want it so much for you. of peace and joy and knowing the heart of God and a closeness with Him. But there will be some dark times and there will be some hard times to get there. But don't give up. Keep your heart pure. Fight. Run to that battle to keep your heart pure. Keep your heart clean before Him. And if you'll entrust yourself to Him who judges justly, not today, not tomorrow, but eventually, you'll find that you're just walking at another level. And many times, it's so long after the attack that you go, what is all this about? I'm just, it's just like good stuff coming into my life from the left and right. I don't even know what caused it. Where's it coming from? And then many times you go, oh yeah, that's right. I, I forgot. <laughs> I responded rightly back there. And then guess what? You'll be at a new level. <laughs> but guess what's coming? another wall <laughs> and it'll probably be a bigger one but guess what you're stronger for it you're ready for it and that wall will take you to a new level into a new level from glory to glory to glory it's God's desire for each and every one of us when they hurled their insults at him he did not retaliate when he suffered he made no threats instead he entrusted himself to him who judges justly can I pray for you Lord Jesus, thank you for the example we see in the life of David, but even greater than that, thank you for the example we see in you. And you didn't just come to be an example for us. You came to empower us to walk as you walk in this world. Holy Spirit, you've been sent to empower us to live that life beyond the natural because we are just dust. If you'd wanted a better product, you'd have chosen a better raw material, but you chose dirt. You made us out of dirt. You know what we're made of. But then you come and fill us with your Holy Spirit so we no longer now are just natural dust. But we are supernatural beings, alive in your Spirit. So God, we're able to respond as Jesus did. We're able to respond by the power of your Holy Spirit correctly. And we're able to go from glory to glory to glory, going through these difficulties and, and each step coming closer to your heart, knowing you better, experiencing you better. 
Lord, it's your way, it's your plan. You send enemies along because we need them in our lives to keep us desperately crying out to you. So, Father, we thank you for the enemies. We thank you for those right now that are being used by the enemy to attack us because, God, they cause us to be more dependent upon you. They cause us to cry out to you on a regular basis. If everything was going well, we'd be less likely to come to you in desperation. But, Lord, that desperation drives us to you, and so we thank you for it. We embrace it because it puts us where we need to be, where we long to be, closer to you and closer to your heart. Lord, I pray for each person here this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are uh, at work in their heart and life, and each person listening now, that you're at work. And God, we just ask you to have your way in us, do in us what you need to do so that you can do through us what you want to do as well. God, we want to bring a smile to your face. We want to honor you with our lives. We just have this one, and we want it to be just consumed in honoring and bringing a smile to the face of the living God. Father, I pray for each person as they go this week, God, as the, may the, the, this not just be a Sunday lesson, but may this be a lesson that we learn how to apply in our lives. When the, when, when the rubber hits the road, when the difficulties come, when the spears are being thrown at us, may we remember this is the opportunity to apply the cross and to move to a new level in our walk with you. Thank you, Father. Just send your people from here with your blessing. May they go out and represent you. May we go out and represent you as your ambassadors to a world that is so desperately drowning in fear, drowning in hopelessness, and so desperately needs the message of the cross. May we be your ambassadors to declare that message to the world this day, this week, and for the rest of our lives. We praise you in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.